Coming up on Tech News Today, Instagram says they're really, really sorry. Nokia might do a Windows tablet. We'll find out if we think they'll be really sorry. And Facebook video ads will autoplay. Sorry, that's what this rumor says. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, December 19th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ring Central. We do everything in the cloud. That's why we love our cloud based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup costs, and Ring Central is $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30 day risk free trial and buy one desk phone and get a second phone free up to 20 phones. Call 800 543 9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zach. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we try to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news. Instagram co-founder and CEO Kevin Systrom responded to criticism over his company's new terms of service yesterday. In his post, Systrom clarified that all users own their photos and privacy settings would not change. He added that it was not Instagram's intention to sell users photos and the company would remove the language suggesting photos could be part of an advertisement. Google Maps is so nice. It helped Apple's iOS 6 installations grow 29% in five days, according to data from mobile ad exchange MoPub. The data comes from 12,000 apps that MoPub monitors. But the CEO tells TechCrunch the numbers verified the hypothesis that people were actually holding back to upgrade until Google Maps was available. Google Maps saw 10 million downloads in its first 48 hours in the App Store. Kodak has agreed to sell off some of its digital imaging patents for $525 million to two patent licensing companies, RPX Corporation and Intellectual Ventures. The money will be paid off by 12 intellectual property licensees, including RIM, Microsoft, Google, and Apple. As a part of the deal, Kodak will settle any current patent-related litigation between the participants and Kodak. Earlier this week, six members of the UK Pirate Party received a letter from music industry group BPI's lawyers regarding a Pirate Bay proxy run by the politicians. The party launched a legal battle fundraiser campaign in response. Today, the party took down the proxy and pulled the fundraiser campaign. Digitimes is reporting Microsoft, Qualcomm, and Compel Electronics are starting backup development of a 10-inch Nokia Windows RT tablet and may announce it at Mobile World Congress in a few months. We've heard rumors of a Nokia RT tablet before, but was reportedly delayed its Windows RT plans after Microsoft had announced the Surface. Sources tell The Verge AT&T is planning to stock a Nokia tablet this year. And Nokia head of design Marco Atasari has said publicly he's spending a third of his time on a tablet. According to iSupply's 2012 forecast, Nokia will no longer be the top dog in cell phone shipments. The new king of the hills got Seoul. Actually, the new king of the hills located in Seoul, South Korea. Of course, I'm talking about Samsung. The company is expected to account for 29% of cell phone shipments by the end of 2012, up from 24% in 2011. This is the first time in 14 years that Nokia isn't number one. Really? You went for the soul pun, huh? Yeah, I did. You spent that one. You know, we can't use that again now. Ever. It's for the rest done. of the year. Yeah. Just for the year. For the rest of the year. <laughs> oh, good. Thank goodness. Uh, Lady Ada got some well-deserved recognition from Entrepreneur Magazine. The head of Ada Fruit Industries, a.k.a. Lemore Freed, is well-known in the maker world and has been named Entrepreneur of 2012. Adafruit did $10 million in sales of its do-it-yourself open-source electronic hardware kits. So congratulations, Lady Ada. A source tells the Wall Street Journal that the Federal Trade Commission is delaying a decision in its antitrust probe into, the, into Google for a few weeks. Uh, Google had been accused of giving service competitors lower ranking in search results, although Google has always denied doing so. It had been expected to wrap things up in the next few days. Google had also reportedly been prepared to make some changes to its business practices to secure an end to the investigation. The developer of FB Purity has been banned from Facebook. FB Purity is a Facebook add-on that customizes and cleans up how the website appears in browsers. The creator of the add-on was charged with violating a rule in Facebook's terms against impairing the proper working or appearance 
of Facebook. Links to the add-ons website have also been blocked on Facebook. Uh, do you need another reason to rage against Facebook? Well, soul. Here goes. Oh, they probably have soul. According to Ad Age, Facebook will introduce auto-playing video ads to its news feed by, the, by April of next year. The move is so Facebook can attract TV ad money and would offer up 15-second video ads. But wait, there's more. The ads could expand wider than the newsfeed column, oh, overtaking the width of your Facebook experience. That's fantastic. It's exactly what I've been wanting as yeah. a consumer of Facebook. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Ring Central. We've told you a bunch of times on this show about how when we built this studio, we need we needed a phone system. You know, we, we needed a professional phone system. It's a big place. You need to have desk phones. You need to be able to get voicemail and all that stuff. And we didn't want to spend a lot of money on it. We like to do stuff in the cloud. We're a technology network. We, we want to be able to get our voicemails wherever we go and get, get faxes in our email and all that stuff. And that's why Russell said, hey, do Ring Central. No PBX system in the basement. Uh, you can get all that stuff in the cloud. Zero startup costs and allows you to easily customize all your call handling. Get your voicemail and your email. Get your fax messages on your smartphone. Ring Central offers all inclusive pricing as low as $20 a month per user. And you can start right now with a 30 day risk free trial. And they have a special offer for our listeners. Uh, when you order one phone, you get another phone free, up to 20 phones. That's right. Buy one desk phone, second phone free, up to 20 phones. So call this number designated for our listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800-543-9980. Once again, 800-543-9980. Or you can also go to ringcentral.com and use the promo code TWIT. Once again, that's ringcentral.com, promo code TWIT. We thank Ring Central for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now, Eric Olander, VP of FBNC Vietnam. Uh, we've had Eric on the show before, back when he was in France. Uh, so you're over in Vietnam now, Eric. In Vietnam, you know, I'll say it right now, get it out of the way. Good morning, Vietnam. Ah, thank you. Now we don't have to make that that joke. That was, there we go. That was, we have the Seoul the joke. We have the Vietnam joke. It's We're a good. very Asian yeah. jokey <laughs> morning so far today. That's awesome. Uh, well, Eric, uh, let, let's start off with something that I don't know is going to be uh, as as widely reported or, or, or as much of a concern in Vietnam, per se. But uh, Instagram wants to increase some ad revenue uh, without spoiling the user design. So uh, Kevin Systrom took to the web yesterday to defend himself against the slings and arrows of the Internet saying, quote, it is not our intention to sell your photos. We are working on updated language and the terms to make sure this is clear. What they want to do is show your friends who follow a business uh, the, as advertising. So in other words, let's say I as uh, follows, I don't know, what would you follow? What's a, what's a good uh, company? Uh, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. All right, fine. Coca I, I as follows Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola wants to advertise to me. So they put a thing in my feed that says, hey, you know, I as follows Coke. Why don't you check out all these great photos of polar bears drinking Coke that we've got in our feed? Uh, and they want the right to be able to show Iaz's picture because I follow Iaz. And so, you know, that makes sense. That's what Kevin Systrom says is what they wanted to do. He has said they re are going to remove the language suggesting photos can be part of an advertisement and reemphasize that you've always owned your photos. Nothing in the proposed terms of service changes changes that. Your privacy settings won't change. If you don't want your photos to be shared with anyone outside of your stream, then they won't be. Uh, but I don't know if it's really changing minds out there. Even National Geographic is panicking. They say they will stop posting pictures to Instagram, and they might even consider closing their account. They have 640,000 followers. Is this an overreaction, Sarah, or is this just sloppy drafting on Instagram's part? Well, I, there are a lot of smart people. Uh, National Geographic is, a, uh, is an account that I follow, but also a lot of individuals that I follow as well who yesterday, even though I don't think that they were misunderstanding what was going on, said... I am uncomfortable enough with this whole thing so that I want to I want to put this Instagram thing on hold. You know, wh whether you're going to move over to Flickr or not is almost irrelevant. Just I am uncomfortable with what's going on uh, with Instagram. I don't I don't have a huge problem with this personally. I'm not going to close down my Instagram account. Uh, Leo and I were talking yesterday and, you know, he kept throwing around the word evil. And I think that you get a lot of this hysteria when a company seems to be doing something that's in the best interest of capitalism and you start throwing around words like, you know, evil and, 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 and big brother and, and this all sort of feeds back into the distrust that people have for Facebook in general, which of course is now Instagram's parent company. So to me, what it sounds like is going on is 
uh, the Instagram folks said, okay, we don't want this mass hysteria. We're just going to reword stuff because somehow our wording scared people. I don't actually think that all of this uh, complaining and threats of leaving Instagram and closing of accounts is changing the policies. I think it's forcing them to change the way um, they state them. Yeah. It's, in other words, as I mentioned yesterday, lawyers try to draft things as widely protective as possible. They don't do it for PR. Uh, and, and so when people saw the things that the language could be used for, Instagram had to quickly say, well, that wasn't our intention. So we're going to write it uh, a, a little more narrowly. But that doesn't, and, and a lot of people are like, ah, so your lawyers suck. You should have written it narrow in the first place. I, that's, that's not right. The, <laughs> the lawyers were probably thinking they were doing a great job in, in casting a wide net. Yeah, I think that. And, and the thing is, the terms of service were more, they were mirroring Facebook's. So it would make sense for, the, for both companies, because Instagram is owned by Facebook at this point, to have a consistent policy. But, I mean, it's, it just goes to show you that with systems posts, it says legal documents are easy to misinterpret. You know, maybe at this point there has to be something like that TOS, TLDR. Remember that, that service that reads this and provides it in English. Maybe Instagram and these other larger companies to stop this from happening in the future need to go, okay, here's what we're saying. Here's what we mean by this. Because it's easy to just read, you know, this little paragraph. It looks, it looks simple. You don't want to scare people with a giant EULA or TOS. But if you don't explain what's going on, there can be a panic. And if, it, if it's based in the language that they used in the terms of service, they can't really do much other than try to weasel their way out. I, I, I think that even if you'd had like a, a, a eulalizer or a, a TLDR version of this, it still would have, I mean, the way they wrote it was that they could take your your pictures and put them in ads. It allowed that. Now, Kevin can say all day long, well, that was never what we intended, but Kevin might not be in charge of the, the, the thing. Uh, uh, you know, it's part of Facebook now. What if they put someone else in charge of Instagram who decides, yeah, we are going to take photos and put it in. It's allowed in there. So they, I think companies are learning we do have to write our terms of service with a little bit of public relations in mind. Eric, I'm curious if, if this is getting any attention in Vietnam at all. No, because because uh, Instagram isn't the player that uh, that say Facebook is over here. But you know, I don't come down on the side of this as being you know evil. This is just dumb, and this is really highlights yet another example. I mean, following in the Netflix tradition here of just crappy communication with your customers. And you know, in my I think what Kevin did is he made the mistake of a kind of thinking that he was Facebook and he can start pulling off things like this in the terms of service. And you know, Patrick Asia yesterday made a very good point by saying that, you know, in Instagram isn't Facebook. There are alternatives for Instagram, whereas Facebook, you're kind of stuck. Secondly, I mean, you can totally tell that this was done by the biz dev people and by the lawyers. And, and the product guys are probably just rubbing their eyes going, don't do this. So, so to me, this falls on the dumb side, it, rather than the evil side. And it just shows that still in the valley, despite all the money, they, that communications and, and marketing and PR uh, still suffer. So I think I think the solution here, Eric, I think you nailed it, is uh, we need companies to start adding don't be dumb to their mission statement. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> right alongside don't be evil. Uh, speaking of Facebook, uh, we could decide what we think of the value of, of this idea, rolling out autoplay video ads into your news feed. Holy moly. Uh, I mean, if anything potentially upsets me more, on Facebook, I can't think of anything. As I has said in the news fuse, uh, Ad Age is, is citing industry executives um, that say ap uh, by April 2013, so really right around the corner, Facebook is going to offer video advertisers the, the, the opportunity to buy spots in our news feeds as Facebook users. This would apply to desktop Facebook users, uh, Facebook users uh, accessing the service via mobile, Facebook users that are accessing accessing the service via apps, pretty much everybody. Um, reportedly, the videos would cap at 15 seconds. Many ad agencies uh, prefer the 30 second model. That's something that you see online all the time. And, and it's something that I, I know for me, I'll go, oh gosh, 30 seconds, gosh, it's just too long for the web. Uh, but uh, traditionally ad agencies are reluctant uh, to shorten the clips. So this could be something that if they were doing it for Facebook, maybe you'd see shorter ads all over the web uh, because, you know, if it works well. Here's the thing that gets my goat the very most. Rumor has it that these ads will autoplay. Now, we all know how autoplay with audio absolutely ruins an experience and can keep you from going to a website forever. It is not clear if audio will be turned on by default. My guess is 
no way in H E double hockey sticks Facebook would ever do something like this because that would be a reason for me to stop using Facebook right there. If there were autoplay video ads that also had audio involved, I I I'd be out the door. Autoplay video ads without audio, eh, not such a big deal. But again, as I has mentioned, if they were to widen in your newsfeed or maybe push down uh, stories in your newsfeed enough so that you were forced to notice them even if they were silent, and they'd probably be that much more obnoxious because it would have to be a video ad that didn't have audio, that would also be intrusive enough to, to really, really upset some people. And you might be wondering, well, why would Facebook even consider this? I mean, that, this is the worst idea in the world. Uh, TV budgets. I mean, TV advertisers who want to advertise stuff like this, they've got big budgets. Facebook could rake in many, many millions of dollars in advertising revenue. And as we've talked about before, advertising uh, revenue is a big moneymaker for Facebook. And they're on the hook to double, triple that revenue in the next year uh, to satisfy uh, to, to satisfy their shareholders. What do you guys think? Do you, do you hate the idea of this? Do you think that I'm overreacting? I think that Facebook could somehow do this without it being super intrusive. If, if it's like those other websites where there's a takeover, the screen goes dark, and there's a video that auto plays, those are the most annoying sites, and that's the ones I use for RSS for because I never want to see that again. I mean, if Facebook wants to bring in advertising money, then they have to do it in a way that doesn't annoy the customer flat out. So they have to figure a way to do this. I could imagine it being a, a setting that you could say, you know, uh, maybe I can get free promoted uh, Facebook posts if I let autoplay go by. Maybe there's some kind of give and take. But apart from that, they can't annoy their customer base to the point where they just leave because it's, they've got a billion people, but they have to satisfy some of them at some point. Now, remember, this is just an ad age uh, re report based on unnamed sources. So let's not let's not get too crazy about what Facebook is or isn't going to do. They're not going to do takeover ads. They're not going to have audio autoplay, at least for goodness sake, I hope not. And Facebook seems smarter at least than that. I would guess that they're going to have video ads that do the thing. I've seen this on plenty of sites where it's just playing and you notice it. You're like, oh, that's playing silently. And the idea is that if you're interested in that ad, you'll unmute the audio and see what's going on there. Uh, and that, that is a typical thing. I, I, um, I would like to point out a positive here. If Facebook can get the length of video ads down to 15 seconds and that becomes an industry standard, more power to them. I hate the fact that you have 30-second pre-roll ads uh, on 30-second clips of video around the Internet. And that we fought that at CNET when I was there, uh, and we fought and lost because what the industry doesn't want to do is redo all their 30-second ads from television. So Facebook can get people to actually make 15-second ads. That actually is going to help the rest of the industry. I, I, I do think that... Uh, Facebook could easily go very wrong with this. Then the one thing is, if you got video auto playing, whether it's muted or not, it's going to eat up your yeah, bandwidth. Bandwidth, right? And it, I guess there's nothing in this report that says whether it's just the site or if it's the site and mobile. I mean, oh, they wouldn't do it on mobile. That uh, again, maybe eventually not, it, this, is no, actually, <laughs> this is all <laughs> guessing. So yeah, I'm guessing. Right. Yeah. Is desktop and mobile. Really, it says mobile auto play. Oh, geez, that's stupid. I mean, well, then it's even I more mean, of a yeah, bandwidth concern. The whole thing sounds kind of stupid. I mean, I guess, I guess if I if I have to just look at this from the entirely opposite angle, there's there's the argument that um, if ads are targeted to you based on the things that you like and, and your habits and your history, they can be better targeted to you. So you could actually get ads that are at least slightly relevant that maybe you'd be interested in rather than just junk. Um, there's a there's a the U.S. House of Representatives passed an amendment. Uh, to the Privacy Protection Act uh, today that, that, that basically involves the, the idea that right now, in the, at least in the U.S., uh, we can't share our Netflix uh, viewing history on Facebook. Now, uh, Tom and I were talking before the show. It doesn't mean that this is now we're all going to be sharing our Netflix history because uh, a similar bill was passed uh, earlier and then it got tied up in, in the Senate Judiciary Committee. But if you think about something like this, okay, say let's say that gets passed. I am a Netflix user. I watch a lot of movies on Netflix and some TV shows. And if I started to get, I don't know, movie trailers that were targeted to me based on my viewing history that I actually kind of liked and maybe I hadn't realized were out there before, it might not be the worst ad in the world. Then again, maybe I'm just being too optimistic. I need to turn it off uh, for bandwidth. That's, uh, that's, that's, the only, that's the only last thing I'll say on that. Let's, uh, let's move along to this uh, Nokia rumor from Digitimes, but it sounds like there's some, some real facts out there backing it up uh, that they're going to make a Windows RT tablet. Right. Like Sarah said, Digitimes reporting that Microsoft, Qualcomm, and Compile 
are working on a 10-inch Nokia Windows RT tablet. Compal would actually make the tablet. Qualcomm would make the processor, which would have been a, a dual-core system on a chip. The initial shipments would be 200,000 units, and it would debut at Mobile World Congress in February. And you know, The thing about Nokia is they've obviously been a Windows phone partner for a long time, but if they introduce a tablet, a Windows RT tablet, that doesn't necessarily have compatible apps with the Windows phone universe that they're in, is this going to cause confusion, or should Nokia be going aggressively into the tablet market? Tom, what do you think? So wait, Nokia is not going to have apps that work on anywhere else on Windows RT? I, I, I didn't quite understand what you're saying there. Okay, because Windows phone applications don't run on Windows RT directly, yeah. uh -huh. will this cause confusion in the marketplace no, when it I mean, comes that's, to... that's no different than than somebody you know saying, okay, I, I, I bought... Uh, I'm trying to think of a, a, Apple? a phone. Mate. Well, no, I, Apple does allow it, mm -hmm. right? Because iPad to iOS. Uh, but if you buy a Samsung tablet uh, or, or Samsung uh, laptop and you buy a Samsung phone, you don't expect them to work together. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that it necessarily immediately causes confusion that my Nokia apps won't work on a Windows tablet. And Microsoft wants, wants that to happen. They do want you to be able to run the apps across platforms eventually. We may have to wait till Windows Phone 9 for that, but I don't think that syncs a Nokia tablet. I think Windows RT has other problems way ahead of that. Eric, do you think that a Nokia tablet could outsurface the Surface? I mean, right now, that's one of the premier RT tablets. There's also one from, I believe, it's, I want to say, Asus has a Vivo Tab RT or it's Acer. I mix those two up all the time. Do you think Nokia can do a good job with this? No, I mean, there's a mismatch in the market here for Nokia, in part because the fact that Nokia's strength in the market it is not in, 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 in the U.S. Uh, in fact, they have very virtually no presence at all. It's in countries like here in Vietnam where Nokia and the developing world has done very well. So when it comes to buying a tablet, why would you buy a tablet that has a license fee? Was it 45, 50 bucks that goes to Microsoft for RT? When you can get a low-end Chinese tablet, uh, you know, built based on Android for a fraction of the price. So in these markets where Nokia is strong in the developing world, people aren't going to pay that RT premium, that Microsoft premium when Android's sitting out there uh, at a much lower po price point. So that inconsistency, this is the place where they would actually sell them, and people aren't going to buy them because it'll be more expensive and there are fewer apps. So Nokia's tablet ideas are dead on arrival, in my view. Sarah, you mentioned that AT&T was planning to stock a Nokia tablet. So if, if this device, let's say this device actually has 3G or, or 4G, do you think that'll set it apart from uh, current tablets out there from uh, Microsoft or things that run uh, Microsoft Windows? <laughs> you know, I, I kind of have to agree with Eric. I, nothing about this excites me, and I'm not exactly sure who would be excited by something like this. I think at and is probably in the business of, of, of offering some variety. Like Tom said, the Windows RT is has got some issues already. So rather than saying, ah, well, that was a terrible idea, you know, the Surface sucks and nothing else is going to be good enough, hey, why not give it a, give it another try um, with another, again, well-known well -known brand. Um, Nokia's got a share of its problems as well, but not necessarily... Um, not necessarily going to make a terrible tablet, but I, I don't, I don't have good feelings about uh, who who would be buying it if it was announced uh, in February of next year. All right, let's take a uh, quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Audible.com, the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. Listeners of Tech News Today can get a free audiobook. And give you a chance to try out the service. One audiobook you might consider is, uh, well, The Life of Pi. It's a great movie that's out right now, and the book's even better. So you can go check out Yan Martel's Life of Pi, absolutely free. I, as you were saying, you're, you, you've got a couple of audiobooks that you've been uh, listening to. Yeah, listen, I constantly listen to the four hour work week because I want to be able to. I can't actually technically do that on this show because we do an hour a day. But the four hour work week. It's a problem with this yeah, show, actually. But the four hour work week, I listen to it uh, and snippets a lot because they're, they are pretty compartmentalized. You can listen to parts of it different times because I don't have a lot of time. I don't have like a long commute or anything, but I can listen to different parts of it all the time. So I enjoy four hour work week, which strangely enough is not four hours, it's 13 hours, but it's mm -hmm. a good book. You have to put in almost four times as much time into the book, but then it, it, it pays it'll back. pay off. Uh, so you, get, you can get that or any audiobook uh, of your choice, any of the one credit audiobooks on there, and that's most of them, uh, at, by going to this URL, audiblepodcast.com slash TNT, you get it absolutely free. And then we're going to throw in an extra book for free by going to this other URL, audible.com slash Sanderson, you get Brandon Sanderson's novella Legion absolutely free at audible.com slash S-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. 
Two bucks, absolutely free. It's a giving time of year, folks. Audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Uh, and let Audible know your thanks for supporting tech news today. Let's uh, talk about this iSupply 2012 forecast. Now, they're calling it a forecast because we haven't got to the end of 2012 yet, but they wanted to put their numbers out before people uh, take off on holiday. Uh, but they essentially are saying by the end of this year, Samsung will have overtaken Nokia officially is the top phone maker, smartphone or not, in the entire United States with 29% of the market. Uh, Nokia slips to second place. Uh, first time in, what is it, 14 years? 24%. Apple's at third place worldwide at 10%, followed by ZTE and LG at 6%. Smartphones, by the end of this year, will account for half of all handset shipments uh, worldwide. So it, we, we've, we've ticked over from uh, feature phones to smartphones leading the way. Uh, and among smartphones, Samsung still number one, 28%. Apple moves up to number two at 20%. Then Nokia, HTC, and RIM uh, at 5% of the smartphone market. Now, overall, cell phone shipments have not increased that much, only 1% over the course of this year. Uh, Eric, I, I was particularly interested in how these numbers match up with what you're seeing in Vietnam. Yeah, Vietnam is really a, a great case study. I mean, this is a country of 100 million people with, you know, 50% of the population under 30. Uh, and so the adoption of, of, of smartphones and the transition from feature phones to smartphones is really going to drive a lot of these numbers. I mean, this is where the growth is for these companies. What I found so interesting and what I see on the streets here, uh, and this is really bad news for RIM and uh, and for uh, uh, for Nokia, is really the, the growth of the Chinese uh, cell phone makers. So you see ZTE here moving into the top five uh, also, the fact that Samsung really is becoming the dominant player, and you just see it on you see it on the street, you see it in the must-have. What are the kids kind of of, of carrying around? And they're carrying around the Note 2, they're carrying around the the S3. Uh, and, and Apple, in some ways, is losing its cachet here, but Apple is still very, very popular. So, and and I think that's interesting in, in a market that is not full of people with a ton of disposable income. They're willing to shell out for an Apple product. It is mind blowing that you know the average income here is about six thousand dollars a year. And phones here are all unsubsidized. So an iPhone costs a thousand. About an iPhone 4S is going for about nine hundred to a thousand dollars. So people are willing to spend a you know a sixth of their total annual income on a phone because it's a fashion statement. It's really also a statement about I've arrived in the middle class, and that's what these phones are about. You know, it's funny you you look on people's phones and they don't even have a lot of apps. They're just carrying around the phone to show everybody else that they've made it. Yeah, and and I, I think that says a lot to why why you see accusations and and in some cases court cases uh, about imitating Apple because everybody wants to be seen as that status symbol. Uh, I read an opinion piece today that was claiming that Samsung benefited from Apple's Samsung patent case because in some people's minds that case showed that Samsung makes stuff that looks like Apple. Do you think do you think that Sam's part of Samsung's rise to the top, Iaz? <laughs> can be just, you know, all publicity is good publicity? I think arguably, yeah. I mean, there's tons of free advertising. Like, it was all over newspapers everywhere all the time because we're talking about a billion-dollar settlement in the United States. Not settlement. Uh, that was the award, the damages award that might be changed. But that number was just screaming on headlines everywhere, so maybe that was good press for Samsung. I think what's interesting about this is that Samsung's got a slew of phones from the feature phones to smartphones. Nokia's kind of, they've kind of slimmed down their lines they do have their Asha line, that their budget line. They have their uh, Lumia lines. But Apple's keeping it at 10%, and they, all they do is make a smartphone. And they don't even offer it. I mean, they offer lower-cost ones at this point. But to be that dominant when you only offer a premium product, just a smartphone, I'm kind of surprised that's actually the case in its worldwide numbers. Sarah, when you look at these numbers, are you, are you surprised uh, to see Samsung as the one that's nudging out Nokia instead of Apple? No, not at all. Uh, Samsung is really, really popular. I, I really don't buy the whole thing that Samsung has become popular because it's benefited from seeming so much like Apple. I mean, Samsung is not some sort of like knockoff handbag you know, that looks so much like Apple that people go, ooh, nobody will know the difference. Samsung is just a cool brand to a lot of people. And, you know, I say this as an Apple user, uh, and, and particularly in a country like Vietnam, as Eric was explaining, where it's like, you got to shell out a lot of money for one of these things. An old standard great phone is not always going to be what, what the kids want. These things change. doesn't mean that Apple doesn't make good products, but Samsung also makes good products. In some cases, they're cheaper, but that's not necessarily the thing. It's just the rise of a new cool brand um, that has, has become dominant worldwide. 
Yeah, let's not also forget that Samsung's done a great job with Android. Uh, you know, I had an HTC One, and it was just a terrible user experience. But people really like the Samsung, you know, user experience on, uh, particularly on the Galaxy and the Note line. So, so that and people talk, and people like that. And so, I think that's also something to be taken into account. All right, let's move along to uh, music development. Scanning your music library and matching the songs to save on uploading and maybe giving you higher quality, that's a, that's a big new thing. Uh, you see lots of different companies doing it. Apple, of course, uh, does it. Amazon does it. Now Google's doing it. Yeah, but, but the difference between Google service and, um, and Apple's is this is free. Google Music added a scan and match feature to its service in the United States. Now, in Europe, they already have this feature. The match songs do count against your 20,000 song limit. Previously, you had to upload all your songs, which could take, I think in my case, took about two days, and I only had 4,000 songs. Over time, the company is also going to upgrade users with existing cloud libraries to automatically match what it can, because the match songs are going to be available for streaming at 320 kilobits per second, like regular Google Play purchases. If you re-download it, it's going to be closer to the bit rate of your original file. So if you're thinking you're going to up upload a 96 kilobit and get a 20 <laughs> back, you're not right. going to be doing that. Sarah, I know you're way into uh, lots of different streaming radio services. Do any of these cloud locker services, do any of these uh, music uh, library services, do they give you everything you want out of these, or did, did somebody need to combine all of the streaming and the lockers into this one giant uh, service? Yeah, that I, I, in a perfect world, that's what I would have uh, because I don't get one thing. I don't have a, a cloud locker storage service and a streaming service uh, all in one, you know, that I can pay something reasonable for. I am almost completely have gone to streaming, uh, which I pay $10 a month for, uh, where I feel like I get a, a huge library of options, not only new albums, but often the same stuff that I have in my old iTunes collection. And I'm not so concerned with accessing a lot of that stuff. I, I don't I don't need to have a bunch of storage space either locally or in the cloud of music that I'm already paying for in another service that that does something nice for me. So I, I think it's good that uh, Google Music is not uh, forcing us now to to uh, uh, you know upload all, all of those all of that music. I know when it first rolled out, it was like you know many many hundreds of hours for some people, depending on how big your collection was. So yeah, this is this is definitely a, a step in the right direction. But I just don't feel like cloud lockers for music are are are, are that interesting to me anymore. Tom, do you isn't think that what Spotify is? I mean, isn't Spotify basically a cloud locker for music? I don't believe you can upload no, to Spotify. No, it's more of a, it's no, a, it's I, no, a no, no, but I'm saying service. conceptually, conceptually, you can get any mu song that you want for the most part that it's already there. I mean, that service is being provided. Correct, but it's not based on your own music collection. It's based on Fair enough. the music collection that they have, uh, you know, they, they have licensing for. Okay, but now that's a question I have is that can you upload all your pirated music to the Google Locker? Yes, you can. Uh, okay, well, that's interesting. And you could, you could do that with uh, Apple and, and Amazon mm -hmm. as well. In fact, when, a when Apple announced their iTunes match service, a lot of people declared it amnesty uh, because they don't check the source of where your MP3 is coming from. They just match it. And you're paying a, f a service exactly. fee to do that, a syntax, as, as they Whereas say. Whereas Google is not Google's paying that check for you. <laughs> I, I, I would just want Google Music now to come out with an iOS app. Done. I'm in. <laughs> Because you know what Google Music doesn't do that, that that Apple does? They don't, like, decide which of your tracks are okay to upload. Oh, that one's shorter than 60 seconds. You can't have that one. Oh, we don't recognize that one. We're not going to upload. No, it's everything goes up there. I've got everything up there already. I don't, I'm don't. too late for the matching service. But the ability to create the playlist and, and put it on iOS, that's the one thing I'm waiting for. I don't believe that they support a certain bit rate or certain file formats. I know I had some, I think, like A3C or AC3 files that didn't work with uh, Google Music. But the funny thing is, like you're saying, you know, applications might be a simple idea. Because I know I was messing with Google Music this morning, and I started closing tabs before I knew my music turned off. Because I'm like, oh, yeah, right. I'm supposed to keep that tab open. Sometimes you need these dedicated apps to make everything come together. Yeah. I uh, I am looking forward to this, though. And, and I don't know. They've come out with a great Gmail app uh, for, for iOS, a uh, great Maps app for Two iOS. Two YouTube apps. Google Music app. Come on. I'll, I'll start buying music in your Play Store and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's, you know, last week we, we looked at Twitter. We looked at Facebook. We looked at Google's look back at 2012. And, and this is sort of another Google take on it. But YouTube is now doing their look back at 2012, Sarah. 
Yeah, in fact, uh, they they have a really cool infographic um, on, uh, on on their Google blog um, over at Blogspot. Um, this is based on data that uh, YouTube compiled uh, with help from the Neiman Journalism Lab and a service called Storyful, and. It, it's it's kind of cool. I mean, it, it 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 shows what were obviously the biggest trending pieces as far as video goes on YouTube, and a lot of this is not going to be a huge surprise. Superstorm Sandy, uh, thirty nine thousand videos in a single week um, based on that storm. Uh, the Weather Channel stream based on that storm got. 13 million views um, in a 70 hour live stream uh, because so many people were flocking to the you know the, the real time feed of of, of, a, of, a, of a network that was going to be capturing what was going on uh, with the storm in real time. Uh, the presidential election in the US, obviously huge. This is kind of interesting. Videos that were tagged either Obama or Romney or both were viewed 2.7 billion times. Now, of course, I could put up a video that had nothing to do with the presidential election and tag it that and I'd be counted. But in general, that's a huge number of videos uh, that were uploaded based on the election and that was that was during the election cycle in 2012, of course. ABC News streamed the debates of the presidential election to over 200 countries, so that they certainly brought it out of the U.S. Uh, the New York Times debate, um, the, the New York Times debate videos uh, uh, that they had uploaded were the highest viewed videos ever for the channel of the New York Times on YouTube. Um, some other trends, of course, uh, Syria, uh, a big, big, big topic. It's going to be a big topic next year as well. But in 2012, 350,000 videos uploaded from Syria um, based on news and, and policies that were going on over there. And, uh, of course, a lot of other big stories, Trayvon Martin, uh, the Mars rover, uh, the Red Bull Stratus jump. Um, that one particularly got 8 million concurrent live viewers, which is which is a record. And then uh, it was kind of interesting for the for the one billion club. It's basically a channel that gets over one billion views, which is, is that's a pretty pretty high mark. Both the Associated Press and then uh, YouTube star Phil DeFranco uh, both got into the one billion view club. So just goes to show you sort of a old journalism versus very new type of news journalism, um, both getting a lot of attention. But this is the stat that I think is just sort of the most mind blowing. And YouTube stats always blow my mind, even though I should just get used to the fact that so many hours of video are being uploaded every day. But 7,000 hours of news related videos were uploaded to the YouTube site every day, all year. That is crazy. News related, not just, oh, Sarah, you know, took some skateboarding photos and, or, or videos and, and, and put them up on, yeah, my, she on does. my channel. All the time. <laughs> so, you know me, I have a real shredder. <laughs> but uh, 7,000 hours of news related videos per day. Well, of course, this is averaging for, for, for 365 days. It's, it's, it's just one of those exponential growth things that always blows my mind. And, and I don't think of YouTube as a news source yet. Uh, maybe I will someday. I, I think of it as as a you know big event thing like Oscars or or Felix Baumgartner stuff like that. But I, I don't I don't go there looking for for news video. Uh, but now that I think about that, I know that lots of times when there was video associated with the news story, it was definitely hosted on YouTube. You just kind of forget it's YouTube because it's embedded somewhere else. I'm curious, Eric, if uh, if the U.S. centricness of this uh, strikes you. From from Vietnam, it does. Oh, well, it does. I mean, I think uh, you know this has been two incredible years for YouTube. You know, don't forget last year was the Arab Spring, uh, and this year was the elections. You know, earlier this year I was uh, the editor in chief at France 24 in Paris, and we had a milestone with YouTube and Daily Motion as well that our live streaming of the French presidential elections on YouTube and Daily Motion outstripped, almost doubled our TV audience, and I think that really shows you the emergence of uh, of YouTube and on-demand video and even live now as 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 a as an important news platform. Problem is that YouTube, as you said. You know, they don't display news very well. You know, their partnership with Storyful uh, is really, really important for YouTube because Storyful is a curator. And I think that's going to be critical to the future success of YouTube is to help surface up a lot of this news so that people can find it. And then they got to do a better job of displaying it. But, you know, here in Vietnam, this is one of the fastest growing markets for YouTube in the world. Uh, the, the the consumption of, of news and, and all content is just surging. So you're going. I think next year we're going to have a similar story. You know, it's going to be from seven thousand to probably eleven, twelve thousand. So these numbers are only going to continue to grow. 
It's funny when when I think of YouTube, I actually when I think of live news things, I go to YouTube and hope that there's a banner on top that says "Watch now" because the the, elec the uh, election results are coming in or the debates are going on because they've set up enough uh, enough events previously that I will check them first at this point. Also, if I was searching for it, I can never find it. I just hope that there's a banner up there. So uh, if they can, you know, if they have all this video, one of the big problems with YouTube, I still think, is the search feature. This is really hard to yeah. find this this video content because you're getting seven thousand of uh, hours of video of news every day and tons of other videos all the time. They should partner up with a search firm. Maybe. What a crazy idea. Maybe they should get bought by one or maybe they should integrate some of the units. <laughs> all right, let's finish up with our randomizer. Randomizer. Now, we could have gone with the, you know, Google doing their own tracking of Santa thing because NORAD's with Bing. Uh, but frankly, I thought this was uh, more fascinating. Uh, a lot of people talking about this. I saw it on The Verge. The iconic Wright Brothers photo. Uh, that we we probably all have seen of of the first flight of the Wright brothers in North Carolina uh, was taken by a guy named John T. Daniels. Now a lot of you probably know his name as well, especially if, if you're photographer buffs. But one thing I did not know, uh, according to Petapixel, this was the first photograph he ever took. In fact, Daniels had never seen a camera before December 17th, 1903, uh, when he went out with Orville and Wilbur Wright to kill Devil Hills prior to launching their aircraft. He uh, he got up, uh, perched his Gunlock Corona 5x7-inch glass plate on a tripod, focused it, prepared the film holder, and man, did he get lucky with his first shot. <laughs> <laughs> it's an iconic shot, but I mean, just it shows you how different uh, photography has become, right? Like, you have to do this setup, you have to wait, you focus, you just hope, and you only have so much film. Back then, versus yeah. now, you just like forty shots in a row. You're like, oh, does it? Did you take that burst shot? No, he's got one chance, and he's got this, and it's awesome. Yeah, uh, Orville helped him set it up apparently, and told him to just like you know squeeze the camera shutter release bulb once we get in the air, uh, and no autofocus, no burst mode, <laughs> uh, you know, no lytro. You know, well, we'll just later. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do the focus later. I mean, even luck. Wonder in. who Instagram would have sold that to. I wonder. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Even kind of got lucky with the the man standing there, so you get a little bit of the scale factor as well. So, yeah, it almost sick. looks like it's an Instagram filter. <laughs> there are filters on Instagram that make photos look like that. The yeah. Right Brothers filter. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the right <laughs> stuff he had that day. Let's take a look at the calendar. Twitter has officially begun rolling out the option to download your archived tweet to everybody. I have been checking all throughout the show. I do not have the option yet. I think it probably has a little bit to do with how many tweets you've sent and how long it takes for them to process it. But once you are able to download them, uh, from what I've heard from other people who are now tweeting about their tweets from a long time ago, they're arranged kind of nicely in, in, a, in a calendar view, so they're they're easy to look through. Also, uh, tomorrow, December 20th, Nintendo is officially launching the TV... TVII Lots for the Wii, for the Wii U in the U.S. and Canada. Also tomorrow, Rim is announcing their earnings. I'm, I'm hoping I'm praying for you. Let's Rim. go, Rim. Do Let's it. Go. Do you it. Can do, do it. Do it. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got a voicemail from someone who calls himself Greg regarding the Amazon smartphone. Fan of tech news today. I was listening to the live stream of episode 651 while driving to my local computer store to buy a new hard drive, and I was thinking about the rumored Amazon phone you guys were discussing. If Amazon released that phone for $100 or so, as Jason thought, and included an Amazon Prime subscription with the phone, that could be a game changer, giving people a decent, cheap phone and Amazon a bunch of new sales. As Patrick and Ayaz both mentioned on the show, the phone could push a lot of sales to Amazon, and if they threw on a Prime subscription, the increase in sales could be pretty dramatic. I know I use my Amazon Prime benefits all the time for my Christmas shopping this year, and if Amazon could train new uh, customers to follow that behavior, the increased sales could really outweigh any losses they got from selling a phone so cheap. Uh, anyways, thanks for putting out such a great show. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season and some great time off. See you all next year. That's TVZ gun uh, out of the chat room. Thanks, Greg, uh, for that intriguing thought of bundling in Prime. Uh, what do you think the chances are? Anybody want to wager? That Amazon would say, you know, would spend a hundred bucks, get a free Prime membership, and then hope that you just keep it, keep renewing it, or even a free month of Prime. Or I'd say 50 50 on the free month, but to differentiate that phone, because the phone market is so busy right now versus tablets and everything. So 50 50. Yeah. All right. I might have to hold on to that. Um, 
or a little you know prediction show we might have coming up. <laughs> you don't want to spoil <laughs> that. All right, check it out next next week. And by the way, those in the chat room are like, "My gosh, his audio was so good. That was an MP3 that he that he sent to us." Mm -hmm. uh, but good good recording. Thanks a lot. An email from Nate. I wanted to comment on your statement about the internet being hypocritical about Instagram's policy change versus the complaints about DRM. I think that this isn't being hypocritical at all, but is a response to situations in which customers have no negotiation power when it comes to these user agreements and privacy policies other than their voice and their ability to leave the service, or in DRM's case, their voice and their buying power. To say that people that complain about DRM and Instagram are being hypocritical is like saying that users should just take whatever is given to them and be happy, but that's not how the free market is supposed to work. Consumers do have the ability to voice their opinions and move their service just like Instagram has to, has to change their policy. And if a competitor comes along with more agreeable terms that people do like, then that's Instagram's loss. Yeah, I agree with you, Nate. Uh, I was posing the question of whether it was hypocritical for people to require or, or request or desire that the industry make their things available for free. But when, it, when the industry took their property for free, uh, we saw a hue and cry. I, you know, my, my own opinion on this is that, uh, yeah, you, you have the right to just go take your photos elsewhere and, and there's lots of other services, uh, out there. So it wasn't so much as a, a statement as a question, but I do think it's a fair question because it's different than can I leave, but is it, is it, is there a difference between us wanting everything on the internet to be free, but wanting to protect our own things? It's not the same people saying the same things. Well, that is it for this episode of uh, Tech News Today. Eric, great to have you back on the show, especially with the perspective uh, coming out of Vietnam. Tell us a little bit about what you're there. It's sort of the CNBC of, of Vietnam, it sounds like. Yeah, so FBNC is the Financial Business News Channel. It's basically a 24-hour all-business cable news channel here into 4 million cable homes. And, you know, there's 170 cable channels here in, in Vietnam. So this is one of the most dynamic, you know, uh, uh, you know, just exciting media markets in the world to be in. So... I think uh, the largest, uh, you know, 24-hour business news channel. There, you got it on screen. Uh, it's all in Vietnamese, but uh, it, it, it's a, you know, it's an adventure every day. Yeah. Well, if you speak Vietnamese, check it out. Uh, that's it for us. You can uh, submit stories for our consideration uh, at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Uh, thanks to everybody who does. You can also find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. Nate Langson from wired.co.uk joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.